We're very thankful this morning to have each and every person on the call, especially those who are not members of the Church of Christ. You are very honored and distinguished guests of our audience, and we welcome you to our services this morning. In the Churches of Christ, we believe that the Bible is right, and every word of the Bible is right. Yes, we believe that Jesus was on Calvary, on Calvary with nails in his hands and his feet, not because we ever saw that, but because of this book called the Bible. It was Jesus who died on that cross, shed his blood, that would wash our sins away according to the Bible. And that blood purchased his church, his bride, his wife, the Church of Christ. They buried him in a borrowed tomb, and he rose on the first day of the week, Sunday morning, and he gave a command to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That gospel is the good news of God's love to the world and his son's death on the cross. He said, he that believe in that, and he was baptized, yeah. And then when you're baptized, you're added to the one church, the Church of Christ. That's the only one in the Bible we we'll ever preach about it or talk about because that's the truth according to the Scripture. So we welcome you to our call. We hope you will consider obeying the gospel, being saved. Jesus said there's only a few going to make it in in Matthew 7, 13, 14. And so that's what we're trying to do in the Church of Christ, be among that narrow-minded few that believe that the Bible is right over mankind. And then to those who are brothers and sisters of Christ across the nation, who are joining our call, you are very welcome to join us on this morning for God's a study of God's Word. Turn your Bible to Revelation chapter number 19. I, I am hoping and praying that everyone has uh, that have been studying with me in this book of Revelation has uh, come to understanding it is, it's really a book that you can understand and learn from. It's not something you should be afraid of or that's mysterious, but it needs to be explained by those of us who a men of God who study the Bible. Jesus, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So God has put uh, men servants on, on this earth. We are earthen vessels. We are to teach, study, and teach the word. And that's my job is to teach it to you. Revelation chapter 19 is where we are. So we're at the point of Revelation where we're in future, future, prophecy now. We, we know judgment has not started. Uh, we, we know that. We're still on earth and Jesus has not come back, but uh, from chapter number 14 up to this point, we have seen the future prophecy of what's going to happen when we, when Jesus comes back. You know, second coming and when everything is going to happen in the moment of twinkling of the eye. And so we get ready now. It's going to happen. And so we, in chapter 19, uh, we have got to the point now where there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the name of this title of the sermon, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, we learn in uh, the harlot, uh, Babylon, the great city of Rome, the Roman Empire, the Roman pagan empire, has been announced as fallen. Uh, and one day, Rome, uh, the home of the Vatican, uh, I pointed that out. You know, I do it in love, but it must be taught that uh, the harlot, the mother of harlots, the terms used by the scripture, uh, is, will fall. And all the teachings of the doctrines and commandments of men, all the denominations that followed uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, all that doctrine will fall, and it's going to come to an end. So uh, here's where we are now in Romans, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says here, And these things, John speaks, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and honor, uh, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Now I encourage you to follow along because I'm using a lot of scripture references and want to take notes of the things that I'll speak about so you can go back and study them again for yourself. There's no way you're going to get everything. I'm going to say that's why it's important that you take notes and you go back and study again like you would if you were going to school or high school. We did that in elementary. We did it in high school. We do it in college. You don't you just got to listen to you, to, you, to your teacher, and then you go back and review some of the things they're talking about. So that's what I encourage you to do. Now, when you look at the word hallelujah, uh, that, that word in Hebrew praise to to Je Jehovah. It's, it's a praise to God of heaven. It's the highest praise, a word used to denote uh, pious joy and exaltation, uh, chiefly in psalms and hymns 
and anthems. And so here it is, because of the fall of the mother of harlots, the heavens are praising God, saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord our God. Now look at verse number 2. In verse 2 he says, For true and righteous are his judgments. So when God made judgment on the world, on all his false doctrine, what they're saying now is that what God judged is true and righteous of the judgment. He has judged, notice what he judged, he has judged the great whore. And that would be a bad word for us to say today if we were just talking about someone. But here it is in the scripture. God refers to this woman who uh, was the great whore, which did corrupt the earth. So she, this woman, this whore, he's talking about, which corrupt the earth, her fornication, and had avenged the blood of the servants at her hand. Now this woman, this great whore, I already talked about this. This is that woman, that whore, uh, the great whore that corrupted her. And she had a fornication, meaning spiritual fornication, because she had children, children. And uh, so we, we talked about that, and I'm going to recap it here just shortly. Uh, so he says, now, again, they said, verse 3, hallelujah, hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. So they're praising God because he made a judgment on this great whore and what she did on the earth and all the fornication she did, which is spiritual fornication. And uh, as a result of that, starting when Pilate killed Jesus, uh, Christians were shed in blood because they were called Christians. They were hanging them, killing them. Uh, they were beheading them. They were hanging them upside down. They were burning them with tar and feather. So a lot of Christians lost their lives as a result of what happened. Pilate initiated that crucifixion. You know, he was the governor of Rome. Now here's the thing. Uh, they're, they're praising God now. In verse number four, he said, The four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne. Now, y'all remember the four and twenty elders from Revelation chapter four, verse uh, six, and there we found the, the elders and, and these angels that we talked about. You can go back and listen to the sermon in Revelation chapter 4. And he says, now, these four and twenty elders and four beasts, which are angels, fell down and worshiped God and sat on thrones, saying, here they go again, saying, amen, hallelujah, highest praise to God. You made, you made this judgment on these, this, this, this great hole in the world, and you have made a call on her. In verse number five, a voice came out of the throne. This it voice come out of the throne. And, and saying, praise our God. His voice comes out of the throne, which is the throne of God. As in, he says now, it comes, his voice came out of the throne saying something. Praise our God. It's not God. It's saying, praise our God and all of his servants. And that ye that fear him, both small and great. So this is an angel speaking. And as I heard, John said, I heard as it were. John said, I start hearing things. What are you hearing, John? The voice of great multitude and a the voice single, of many waters. So he's hearing this sound and the vo- as the voice of mighty thundering. Saying Hallelujah! These, these, these angels are praying, uh, praising God for the Lord God. Notice the word omnipotent reign. Now here's why they can celebrate. They said our God, who reigned, is omnipotent. Now what that means? Omni means all. Potent means powerful. So, uh, you know, you can say omni, uh, omnipotent, or you can say he's all-powerful. So we're going to understand all-powerful a little better, right? Our God that we serve you on is on high. He's all-powerful. This is time you can say hallelujah if you want to. See, if you can, if you can think like these angels, they're saying hallelujah. Highest praise to God. And this is something we ought to celebrate this morning. Members of the Church of Christ can celebrate. That we serve a God who's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, and he's still reigning. And so what are they What are they celebrating, though? This is the question we have to ask. What are they celebrating? They're, they're praising God for the fall of the great whore, the fall of the Roman Empire, 
which is the home of the Vatican. They are praising God for the fall of false doctrines and their teachers. Now, I have proved, whether you want to believe it or not, but I proved with the scripture. There is only one church in, on this earth that qualify as the great hope. And I proved that last week when I went over there and showed you all. In First Timothy 4, 1, 2 Timothy 4, 1, I showed you that the Bible said the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some shall depart, First uh, Timothy 4, 1, excuse, from the faith, giving heed to the seducing spirit. Notice this. The Spirit said, this, this is God saying, I'm going to identify her, I'm going to identify the Spirit is saying expressing. I'm saying she's pointing. The Holy Spirit is saying this is the this is the church I'm talking about. Latter time though people would leave the faith, which is the scripture, they would give heed. Notice who they, who's leading this group, seducing spirits. And notice what he says, doctrines of devils. What are they going to be doing? What are the doctrines of devils? These seductive spirits going to be teaching, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, they're not going to have a problem telling people these lies. Here's what the lie: first lie they're going to tell. They're going to forbid to marry and command them to abstain from meat. So the only church in the United States on this earth that forbid a priest to marry and tell people they can't eat meat on a certain day is the Roman Catholic Church. There is no doubt. You you just got to be blind to not understand. No, no, you don't want to know it. Cause this is true. Everybody know. That it's all over the world. Everybody knows those priests are raping those little boys. When you tell a man he cannot have a woman, that man has a sexual desire. He's going to fulfill it some kind of way. And the way these priests are fulfilling that sexual desire, they, they molest them little boys and they rape them nuns. That's what they were doing. They were, And, and I, I prove that it's all in encyclopedia, uh, uh, Wikipedia. Just go Google it. <laughs> Just Google it. It's all over the news. You don't have to be smart to figure this out. The script is, the spirit is saying exactly who they are. And so, well, well. so did I do it? Me? No, I didn't. I did it because people need to know this truth. You can stick your head in the sand or you can come out and admit it. You know that's wrong to tell a man he can't have a woman. Men ain't going to do things like that, y'all. We all know better than that. In First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Paul said, Now concerning things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. One time, a brother was reading this, uh, reading this scripture, and the man said, uh, it's good for a man and a, not to touch a woman, and, and the brother was listening. And then in verse 2, he said, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. That brother said, Whew, thank God for nevertheless. <laughs> yeah, why? Because he knew not to touch a woman would be a difficult thing for a man. And so the scripture said, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. That's why you can't tell a nun she can't have a husband. You can't tell a priest he can't have a wife. Why? Let the husband render unto his wife due benevolence. Now, that's not, that's not giving away food right there. Now, y'all know due benevolence is a sexual fulfillment. And likewise, a wife unto her husband. Now, that's in your Bible. Now, here's somebody say, well, I just don't believe that. Well, you don't believe the Bible. That's your problem. You will never get to heaven until you decide to believe the Bible. When you decide to be, believe the Bible, you have no problem with a preacher like myself. Now, if you don't believe the Bible, you're going to have a problem with Brother Brooks. But I don't have a problem with you because the problem is going to be between you and God. You know, at the end of the day, I'm going to do it just the way the Bible says it, and I'm going to preach it without fear. Uh, without fear, I'm not going to try to please people. Uh, if you seek to please men, you're not the servant of Christ. That's what the Bible says. So I'm not saying I'm not doing this to please. I'm not doing it to be arrogant. I'm just saying this is the truth, and you got to know it. So I proved that. Now, I went back and hit it again today. I said the last week. I nailed it. It's, that's the Roman Catholic Church. The first church that broke away from the one church in the Bible is the Roman Catholic Church. She became the universal church of the world, the papacy or the Papa of the Pope of the church. Now, they said Peter was the first Pope. Let me tell you this, that Peter was never referred to as a Pope. He was an apostle. Never was he a Pope. And they kissed the feet of, of Peter right now on a statue up there in Rome. And they would bow down to the Pope because he's God. Why do you say he's God? 
in their book called the Catechism, they say he's a pope, he's infallible, which means, let me tell you all something, when you say a man is infallible, that means he cannot sin. He cannot sin. Now, the Bible says all have sin. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not a man on this earth who don't sin. That's blasphemy. That's sinful. There's no man, no matter how white your, your robe may be, you're not that pure. People ought to get this. Why can't some people see this? They're blind. They're blind. you got to be blind to believe this stuff. Well, you say, brother, where do you get that information from? In a book called The Catechism, what they teach their people. Go read it. It's in there. He can't make mistakes. He can write by, He can write doctrine. He, he's called the pop of the church. He's called the pope. He's the vicar, V-I-C-A-R, of Christ. Look it up. Vicar Christ, which means one who stands instead of another. What does that mean? He's Christ on earth, you all. And we all know better than that. So, Robert, why don't the, the Catholic members know? But they don't read their book. They don't read this stuff. They don't read the Bible. Do you know? Don't you know most people in the nominated church don't read? They, they carry around with them. Even when I grew up in the Baptist church, we didn't read our Bible. If we'd have read our Bible, we'd have known that God don't hear a sinner's prayer. We'd have known that you just can't not call upon the Lord and receive him in your heart as your personal Savior. We'd have known that baptism wasn't an outward sign in with grace. We would have known. We would have known that there was no Baptist church in the Bible. We would have known all these things. But we didn't read the Bible. You say, well, who is we? Me, my family, your family, and most people in the Baptist church don't read the Bible. They carry it around with them. And the preacher will take one verse and, and launch from the Bible. And after that, he go off to his hoop and, I'm young, young, just, you know, stuff like that. You don't, you don't understand what he's saying. At the end, the piano comes on. And then he start hooping, what they call hooping. They teach him how to do that as preachers. We don't hoop in the Church of Christ. We preach the word. The instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all of them suffering and doctrine. So I had to come back and deal with that. Because here's the thing. Heaven is celebrating this, this matter. That God has took them down. He's took them down. Roman Catholic Church, he's going to take down all the denominations that followed her. You say, well, who are those? Who are the daughters uh, the, the mother of Holy, all the denominations that came after her, they all fell away from the truth because there are no denominational churches in the Bible. And there's some good people in these churches. Let me tell you something. Good people don't go to heaven. It's obedient people that go to heaven. Hebrews 5, 8 said, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation. Now, watch to who? To all them that obey him. And let's go back to Revelation. In verse 7, he said, let us be glad and rejoice. They, 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 they rejoice in him. They celebrate. Give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. Oh, the, the marriage? There is a marriage of the Lamb. Yeah. It's come and his wife. So the Lamb has a wife, has made herself ready. Ah, oh, that's what it said. The Lamb is come and... His wife, so the lamb is a his, his wife is a her, herself ready. Look at that. That's in your Bible. Verse 8. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Well, first question we got to have is, who is the lamb? Who is the he in this in this verse? Well, we, we know John 1 and verse 29 the Bible said, John saw Jesus coming. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. So Jesus is the Lamb. Christ is the Lamb. And look at this. The Lamb, so Christ, has a wife. His wife has made herself ready. So in Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, Paul says to those, uh, the Old Testament, to those uh, Jews of the Old, they, remember, I proved that God had a wife. Israel was his wife. He divorced her. And now Jesus has a wife. He said, now, so Paul says in Revelation, Romans 4, 7, 4, excuse me, Romans 7, 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also uh, become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now, watch what he said. He's talking to Christians. That ye should be married to another. Huh. The Christians are married? Yes. Now, he's going to tell us who we married to. Even to him who was raised from the dead. That's Jesus. So the Christians are married to Jesus. Why? Oh, hold on. 
<laughs> the Christians are married to Jesus, yes. See, so that tells me when John said in verse in verse number nine, he said the angel said to him, he said, Write this, John. So John is to write this down. Here's what here's the blessed. Blessed are they, I mean verse nine which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the blessed people will be those who go to the Father's house for the supper of the marriage supper of Jesus, who is the Lamb. And then the angel said, and he said unto me, John said, the angel said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Oh, so this is true. Here's the true sin. John is told by the angel to write this down. The husband is Christ, and the wife, we will find out who she is. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. The Bible says, for the husband, Paul is speaking, is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So he's comparing the husband, man, to his wife, as Christ is the head of his wife, the church. And he's the savior of the body. He said, he don't, he said, he don't say the church is his wife. He's going to say it. Just wait a minute. Therefore, as, Christ, as the church is subject unto Christ, he says, so let the wives be their own husband in everything. So the church, the wife of Christ, is subject to her husband, which is Christ. Husbands, love your wives. And he's talking to me to love my wife. You are the, uh, every husband is to love his wife. Here's how we love our wives. Even as Christ also loved the church. In other words, he gave him something. So every husband on this phone should love his wife to the point where he's willing to die for her. That's a comparison. That he might sanctify. Now here's Jesus. He loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify, set it apart, cleanse it. He's going to take the church. He's going to set it apart. He's going to cleanse it. And with the washing of water by the word. So it's going to be a washing of water by the word. That he might, now here's why he's doing it. That he might present it to himself as a glorious church, notice not, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that it, talking about the church, should be holy and without blemish, so all men to love their wives as their own husbands. Our own body, excuse me. And he that loved his wife, loved it himself. Verse 29, For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. So the Lord did never hurt his wife. And he's saying, man, you don't touch your wife. Christ never hurt his church. Notice, but for we are members. Then he's telling, and Paul says, we are members of his body. These are Christians. Of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father, mom, and daddy, and cleave, shall join unto his wife, they two shall be one flesh. Now, here he comes, verse 32. But this, this is a great mystery. Paul says, y'all, y'all think I'm talking about Tom and his wife? No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I speak concerning Christ and the church. So notice, the she here is the church. The, the church of Christ, the church is Christ's wife. And the husband of that church is Christ. And here's what you need to understand from Revelation. The only blessed people are those who are members of the church of Christ. They are the one, that's the one wife Christ has. Oh, brother, that's why, I know, I know. I told you, I told you at the beginning. If you don't believe the Bible, you ain't going to believe nothing up to you. But if you believe the Bible, you got to believe Christ got a wife now. you got to believe that wife is his church, his bride. 
And those are the only those who have answered the gospel call are blessed to go to the supper. That's where I want to emphasize. When a man takes his wife home to, to his father, they go into a supper. They go to celebrate. I'm going to the supper. And that woman, got, that wife going to be washed in the lamb blood. Her red wedding garments, her dress will be arrayed in fine linen. It's going to be clean. It's going to be white. And the saints, he says, the saints, verse number eight, look at that. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So every member of the church has to be washed. They got to be washed in order to go to the marriage supper. You remember when Jesus said in John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house and many mansions. If it not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare for you, a place for you, come again. I'm going to receive you unto myself. He's talking about that church. Get where I am. You may be also. That's what Jesus said. Chapter 14, 1 through 3. Now notice. Brothers, sisters, and friends, especially visitors, members of the church who have left the church, you got to get cleaned up in order to go to that Father's house. You can't go to the supper if you ain't been washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you're on this call and you have not been baptized, you're not going to the supper. If you're on this call, and you left the true church, the church of Christ, you ain't going to the supper. You're not going. Jesus is right now at the Father's house, but one day he's coming back, he's going to get his bride, and he's going to take her back to the Father's house, and it's going to be a big celebration. It's going to be the supper. Will you be at the marriage supper? This is my question. Will you make it to the supper? Only if, I'm going to give you the answer, only if you've been sanctified and cleansed with the washing of water by the word. That's baptism. Ephesians 5, 26. Only if you've obeyed the true teachings of the, of the Bible, which is the doctrine of Christ, Romans 6, 16. 2 John verse 9 says, Whosoever transgresseth the body not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abided in the doctrine of Christ had both the Father and the Son. John will re refer to it as the testimony of Jesus. That's the New Testament. See, if you want to call today, you can't, there are no Christians in the Old Testament. When Jesus died is when the Christians came on the scene. That's when he purchased his bride. And then he gave the command that every, part, every creature had to be baptized in Mark 16 and 15. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, the people had killed you. They asked him what to do. He said, be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, 16, tell us that sin washed away, that our sins are washed away in baptism. Only if you have contacted the blood of Jesus, you contact the blood of Jesus in the watery grave of baptism. See, what happens in baptism is the blood of Jesus, God performs an operation under the water. Man can't do this. God does everything under the water. You hear these guys talking about, well, baptism is just a word. God is doing the work. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. In, in, in verse 11, he said, Whom ye also, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, to put off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried it with him in baptism, wherein ye also risen with him through the faith, notice what, of the operation of God to do a circumcision uh, as we know it today, it requires surgery. To, in baptism, God surgically removed the, the operation under the water is God surgically removing the sins of the flesh who has raised him from the dead. That's him. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has quickened together and having forgiven you all of your trespasses. When did all of our sins be forgiven? When we baptized for remission of our sins. He said, well, well, brother, what happened? How did this sins get forgiven? Well, Hebrews 9.22 said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So it required the shedding of blood. So in baptism, according to Revelation 1.5, it's in baptism, 
that we contact that blood, and that blood then washes away our sins and baptism. You ain't going to get baptized if you don't believe that. You know, but you can't go to the supper. Just remember that. Brother Brooke told you that. He said, well, brother, I, I'll take my chance. Go right ahead. Take your chance. But I'm not taking no chance. If Jesus said get baptized, get baptized. You don't question that. Just do it. Quit questioning God. Why would people question this? It amazes me how people just question baptism when Jesus directly commanded it. Matthew 28, 18, he's going to go teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So why am I spending time on baptism? Because there are people on this call, no doubt. We've had a lot of people on the call. You've heard me over and over. You still ain't got baptized. You know why? You don't believe it. Ain't nobody going to stay in a house that's burning and, and not come out. When you know you lost and you know you need to be saved, you're not going to stay in that house. Wait a minute. I don't understand why he or she won't get baptized because they don't believe it. That's why. People who don't believe in baptism are not going to get baptized. People who don't believe the Bible are not going to believe what it says. You can't make a person believe the Bible. They've got to decide to believe it themselves. And when they believe it, they are no longer question baptism. I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm just calling it out. You know, you're an unbeliever what you are. Amen, was. Well, I just said it like I think I should say it. People would wish, wouldn't they? They'd have heard preachers like me. They're going to wish. People would wish one day they'd have heard preachers like Peter, Paul, and James, and, and those of us in the Church of Christ who still hold to the truth. Let me say this, too, to the members of the church. There are, members of, there are preachers in the Church of Christ that left this truth, too. They don't preach baptism no more. They don't preach the one church anymore. But why? They don't believe it. You can't tell a person any church would do. If you don't preach the one church, you don't believe in one church. So don't know. Let's, let's make sure we identify all those in the church crowd. Maybe some of you on the call here at some of those congregations where your preacher don't preach about the one church. You got to question him on that. I'd get out of there myself. That's what I would do. I would tell him to listen to this recording. Uh, yeah, listen to my sermon. You can tell him my sin. I'd get out of there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit at the feet of a man who don't believe in the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism, the one church, the one body, the one baptism. Why would you believe in somebody like that? Now, follow a leader who don't believe in the Scripture. That's the only thing we have. All we have is the Bible. Ain't nobody been to the graveyard and back to tell us that it's wrong. Until somebody do that, I'm going I'm to keep preaching just what it said. I wouldn't be in a congregation where men lead the truth, beatbox and bass mic and not preaching the one Lord, the one faith, doing all everything, praise them, the praise team, all that stuff is not in the Scripture. I'll tell you what COVID done did. Listen to me. COVID shut down the beatbox. Shut down, praise down, he sent everybody home. God sent everybody home with COVID. They ain't praise dancing now. Ain't nobody beatboxing the mic now. I've been preaching against this for 10 years. God took COVID and shut all of it down. Shut it all down. Yeah, sure did. People going to wish they'd heard a preacher like myself. They wasn't afraid to say it. Now, verse number now, I know this. Now, people... Uh, I know I know not a lot of people that's going to, you, you got to believe like me to, to, to sit under my teaching because uh, it, 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 it's, it's a straightforward teaching, you know, kind of, you know, straightforward, don't cut to the chase, you know, not try to save feelings. We're trying to save souls. And like my children, I, I love them, but if I have to put something on them when I, they were, I was raising them, I'd put it on them. I'd put it on them uh, because I love them. Sometimes we have to we have to get we got to get hit with the word of God for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two as his soul. Piercing even the body and son of the soul and spirit of the joints and the discerner, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is like a sword, it cuts going and coming. Now let's go back to Revelation. Uh in verse 10. Let's, let's watch this now. I want y'all to pay attention to John. No, John got too excited when he heard about this wife. He heard about the supper, and John probably like me. He want to go to the supper. And watch John now in verse 10. It's, it's kind of interesting what happens here. John said, I fell at his feet. He, now he's talking about, I'm going to show you a minute, he's talking about an angel, that, that angel that was talking to him. He fell down to worship that angel. And listen to what the angel said. The angel said unto me, see that I do it not. Don't get up. What are you doing? And I, the angel said, I'm a servant. I'm a fellow servant like you. And that brethren, and have the testimony, I'm just telling what Jesus said. The angel said, get up. I'm a servant. I'm a brother. I'm giving you the testimony of Jesus. He said, you worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
He said, I'm telling you what God said is going to happen. You get up off your, you get up off your knees pray, and praise to me. John, you got too excited. I'm going to show you. I'll turn to, uh, uh, you turn to Revelation chapter number uh, 22. Everybody turn there real quick. Revelation 22, 7. John did it again. John, John, John didn't get it. In Revelation 22. He said, Behold, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now here it is, verse 8. I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of an angel. So he points out, I, I fell down to the angel. We showed me these things. John got excited when he saw this stuff. Then he stood up and the angel responds. He says to me, See thou do it or not. John, don't worship me. I'm an angel. For I am a servant. So an angel is a servant. He said, I'm a servant like you, John. And I'm that brethren, the prophets. I'm a brother. So angels are our brothers in Christ. They're not to be worshipped. So, and he said, them which keep the sins of the book, you worship God. That's what he said in Revelation 22. Now, now, if we understand this common sense question, if an angel is just a brother, and he will not be referred, he will not be worshipped. He said, "I'm a brother," and wouldn't let John fall down and worship him. Why is it that people would fall down and worship the Pope? I'm gonna take it a little farther than that one. Why would any preacher? allow himself to be called reverend. When the Bible says Psalm 111 verse 9, he sent redemption unto his people. Oh, he had commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. So as a preacher, I'm a brother, just like that angel is a brother. And Jesus, uh, and Job 32:21, Elihu said, let me not, I pray you, accept any per man's person, neither let me give Flattering titles unto man. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker will soon take me away. That Job 32, 21 through 32, 22. It's clear to me that men are not to be given any type of religious titles. Reverend, doctor, even in church Christ, some of them call themselves doctors. That is forbidden, you all. You should not refer to no preacher as doctor, nothing. On the campus, he's a doctor. If he's your math teacher, you can call him doctor on the campus. But when it comes to the pulpit, he is a brother. I don't care how smart he is. The scripture is still telling us that's a flattering tower. That exalts a man beyond where God wants him to be exalted. And even if the angel wouldn't allow it, and the angel says the brother, then Jesus was making it clear in Matthew 23, 7 through 9. He said, greetings in the marketplace to be called me and rabbi, rabbi. That's a religious tower. Be ye not called rabbi. Jesus said, don't do that. For one is your master, even Christ, and you are all brethren. So what am I called in the church of Christ? I'm Brother Brooks. Why? That's all I am, my brother. I'm a servant, just like the angel. Y'all ought to see this. And then look at verse 23, verse 9. Every Catholic ought to read this and call no man your father up on the earth. And this ain't got nothing to do with my daddy, Carter Brooks. This got something to do with a, a religious leader calling himself father. This is a religious title. For one is your father, which is in Christ, and which is in heaven. Need ye be called master, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest, verse 11, among you shall be your servant. Ain't that what the angel said? I'm a servant. Yes, he did. So what are preachers in the church of Christ? Servants. Should they be called pastors? No, if they don't qualify, they're preachers. A, pre a qualified pastor is an elder in the church. He's a husband and a wife, and many more things he must have. You've got to have more than one to have an elder. But a preacher can be a preacher. He don't have to be married or anything. However, I'm not a pastor. I'm Brother Brooks. I'm the preacher, minister, or evangelist. That's what they call us. Now, you say, why did I spend time on that? Because people people caught up in this kind of stuff. They just fall in. I mean, folks just do anything to me and say, well, I'm Reverend so and so. No, you're not. And I help you. If they get it so, it's so bad that I can tell a person, uh, I'm just Brother Brooks. They'll still say, Reverend Brooks. <laughs> Man, I'm not Reverend. Okay, you know, we didn't get this right. That is not good. Yeah, so let's go back to Revelation, which I can close this out. Now, yeah, I, I dealt there. I dealt there because we needed to deal with that. 
And verse 11, and John, go back to John. John said, I saw heaven open. So now go back and watch what John sees now. John said, he thought, look, and he said, there's heaven open, y'all, watch it. And behold me, look. He said, I saw a white horse. What you see, John? A white horse. And he that set up on him. John said, I see the one that set on the horse. He was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. Okay, he's called faithful and true. He's sitting on a white horse. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name that no a man knew, but he himself. He said, Who is this he's talking about? Don't worry, just let, let's keep reading. The Bible will answer who this is. Verse 13. John said he was clothed with a vesture. That's, that's a cloak, like a coat that goes all the way down. And John, uh, his vesture, uh, this vesture, he's on his white horse. He has this vesture on. He's is dipped in blood. And his name, he's starting to identify him now. He's called the Word of God. He's called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. John said, I see an army following him. He's, got, he's on his horse. He's got a name. His clothes, his vesture was dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were around him in heaven followed him upon the white horse, clothes and fine linen, and white and clean. So though that army of people, notice they got the same thing on that he said the bride would have on. Fine linen, white and clean. We're going to find out who these people are. And out of his mouth go the sharp sword, and with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with iron rod of iron. And he tread the winepress, and of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. Here he comes, verse 16. Who is this, John? He had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, there it is. There it is. No question now who we're talking about. This is Jesus, the Christ on the white horse, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, riding the white horse, his clothes, though, that vesture, is what he wore from the time they whipped him with the whip. Remember when they tied him, they scourged him, they hit him with that whip, called a flagellum? When Pilate said, he did nothing wrong, y'all. And the people said, crucify him, crucify him. He said, well, can I release Barabbas unto y'all? They said, no, kill him. But Pilate said, no, let me, let me beat him first. So he beat him with this whip. And Isaiah said, by his stripes over here. So that whip put stripes all over his body. And from the stripe came blood. And he wore that coat from the beating to, the, to, the, to Calvary. And now he's saying it's bloody. It was so bloody that that vesture was it dipped in blood. That means it was dripping with blood, y'all. So here he is, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, riding on the white horse. His vesture is dipped in the blood that will wash up his bride. And he's called the Word of God. How do we know? In John 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life. And life that was, was the light of men. And the light shining in darkness. And the darkness commended it not. And then in verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh? Yeah. And the wealth among men. John 1.14. And we will build his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and mercy. The only begotten is the only begotten Son of God. So the Word of God is Jesus Christ. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Now, who are these? What is this army of people? Look at his saints. His wife, his church, is the army following and fighting for him. You know what we do when you preach what I'm preaching? While we're still in, we fighting for the cause of Christ. Don't y'all know that? We are his saints. We are the armies of God. That's right. That's why Paul was able to say he fought a good fight. He kept the faith. What are we doing? We fighting for the cause of Christ. And these are the saints that are there that day. When he's coming back, he, they're going to be following. They're going to be going right with Christ himself. He's taking them back home. What are, what are they? What are we using while we're fighting? Look at what the saints had been using. In verse number, uh, uh, verse he said they had, and out of his mouth came a sharp sword that whipped it should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with wild iron and the tread tread the wide press, wide press of fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So what are we using today to fight? In Ephesians six seventeen, Paul says, "Take the helmet of salvation." and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12, The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. There it is, two-edged sword, piercing the divine, the Son of soul and spirit, of joints of marrow, the zone of thoughts and intents of heart. I'll tell you, if you want to win the battle against Satan, you best know that the Word of God will do the job, because it is a sword. Mess around and miss heaven. Not knowing what the Word of God says. Men who don't use it and don't use it to cut out false doctrine, I, I, I'm going to use the Word of God. And, you know, when you use the Word of God, it's a sword. You ain't going to hurt them. It's going to cut out false teachers. Cut, use the sword of God, cut out false doctrine, cut out reverend, cut out doctor, cut out father, cut out denominationalism, cut out uh, sin and prayer. Cut out all this stuff people are doing and teaching against the Word of God. I can use the Word of God and teach it, and it, it rules in matters of religion. The Word of God will rule. Christ and His Word will defeat denominationalism. It will defeat false teaching every day, all day. In Revelation 19, he's talking about here a name written that no man knew. Probably the name in Revelation 2.17, a name which will be disclosed to those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation 2.17, he said, He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. Him that will come, I will give unto him, give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name written, which no man knows, save he that received it. I want my stone. I want my new name. I don't know what it's going to be, but I sure want mine. I don't know if y'all want y'all, but I want mine. In Revelation 3.12, he said, Jesus said, he that overcome it, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Well, he said, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. Notice he said, I'm going to write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which is new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God. I will write upon him my new name. He talking about the church. I told you, I talked about that. Then go back and listen to my sermon, Revelation 3. I talked about that new Jerusalem, which is the church, the church of the firstborn, and the firstborn of Jesus Christ, which is the church of Christ. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's pretty clear. So look at verse 17 as I close. I saw an angel standing in the sun. John sees an angel that standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying, Oh, to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper. Here's the supper of the great God. Whose supper is it? Of the great God. That ye may eat flesh of kings and flesh of captains and flesh of mighty men and flesh of horses and them that sit on them and all the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. All the birds of heaven will feast on flesh of the wicked. Now, I saw, John says, I saw the beast, the beast being an angel, and the kings of the earth. Uh, this is not a good angel. Kings of the earth and their armies gather together and make war against him to sit on the heart. And I say, so this this beast, you know, we know we talk about Satan and his angels. Uh, they gonna fight against this he that sit on him, which is the king of kings, and against his army, which is the church. Now, notice this: he's fighting against us, but the war is over. It is over as soon as it starts. Why? Hallelujah! He just said, "The Lord God omnipotent reigns. He's all powerful. Satan can't, Satan can't defeat 
the Word of God. He can't defeat us as we teach from the Word of God. Satan can't defeat us. The war is over. It's God's war. It's over. The war is over. It ain't going to be no thousand days, thousand years. He's going to fight with Satan. That's over. A thousand years of God is like one day. You know, this is over. There it, it, it ain't no fight going on here. He, it, 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 it can't, he can't win. The, the church of Christ, can't, the, Satan can't win against the true church. He can't win against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And notice what John said in Revelation 19, 20, and the beast was taken and with him. Look, that's who was going out, the false prophet that, that walked, wrought miracles before him, which he deceived, talking about the devil, him, them that had received the mark of the beast. That's 666. That's the number of the man. Anything taught by a man is a six. And he that worshiped the image, though these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning. It's over. I told you it was over. And bring them It ain't no fight. It's over. Satan's going to be thrown in the pit. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. And anybody who followed him don't go in the pit with him. So it proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with the flesh. The harlot, notice it, the harlot is gone, the mother of harlot is gone, the earth, the beast, and the sea beast is gone, the fall of, the, of Rome, the fall of false doctrine, the fall of denominational churches, the fall of false teachers, all happen right there. As in every case, the battle is over. God is won. He's going to win. The victory is Christ. That's why he said, that's why he said, you know, hallelujah, what? Lord God, I'm nipping in the rain. He's all powerful. Who's going to win? Christ, it is Christ who brought victory to the world. Satan is defeated. When people obey God, they have defeated Satan. That's why you ought to be in the true church. That's why you ought to be baptized. That's why you ought to be taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Yes, every Sunday, not on the first Sunday. Acts 20, verse 7. Somebody goes, well, Brother Brooks, I got a friend of mine, a, a, a loved one, a my auntie, uncle, grandma, granddad, and I know you, what you said, but these are really good people. Again, there were good people the day of Jesus that were doing the living. I don't know that. It was good people living there. It was Jesus who said in Matthew seven twenty one, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. These were believers. These were not people who didn't believe in Jesus. They called him their Lord. He said, they're not going to heaven. They're not in a, they can't go to heaven. He said, they, many were saying to me that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name done many works. On the day of Jeremiah, we were saying, we did all this in your name. Jesus said in verse number 23, I will confess unto them, I never do. Oh, it's going to be a sad day. It's going to be a shock to Christians. People who call themselves Christians that have not been baptized, they are not in the, in the, they're not a part of the bride, which is the church of Christ. You're not going to the supper. I don't, you don't, I don't know you. You don't have a name. What do you mean? You have, you weren't born again. You weren't washed in the blood. Your, your your linen is dirty. You don't have the marriage gown on. It's got to be clean. It's got to be washed. It's got to be purified. It's got to be sanctified. That's what he did for his church. If he did five twenty three through the following verse, I read that to you. The mystery was he was cleaning up his wife to take her back to the father's house, and she got to be washed in his blood. That's plain, my friends. In verse 20, I'm closing. All this, the remnant was slain with the sword of him, the self on the 21, rather, with sword proceeded out of my last word of God. The word of God is what we're going to use to defeat Satan. And I'm doing that this morning. Now, I want you all to hear it carefully. We serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's called the King of the Lord. David said in Psalm 24, the vision, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they just dwell therein. Psalm twenty four one through ten. For he had founded it upon the seas, established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in the holy place? He that had clean hands and pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings from the Lord and the righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him. They seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? Verse 8. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. The king of glory 
shall come in. Who is the King of glory? David writes, the Lord of hosts, the King of glory. That's him. If you're on the call today and you're not a Christian, and you've heard me perfectly, unless you hung up, but if you've been listening, you should have heard this. That God sent his son. Let me put it in, in the closing statement, in closing, where you're presenting the gospel to you. The good news is this, John 3.16. God so loved you and me that he gave his only begotten son, who was known as the word. His son then comes to the world through Virgin Mary. He lives among men about 33 years, and they would kill him. They would kill him after beating him and whipping him and spitting on him and slapping God's child, his only son. And then they would hang him on that cross with nails in his hands and his feet, my friend. And then he was on that cross because he was doing the will of his father. And the will of his father that he would be slain, he would be killed, he would be led as a sheep to the slaughter. And before shears done, he, he would open out his mouth. He knew he had to die. He knew his death would be the only way we could be saved. And when he died on that cross, his, his best, he had been beat so bad that that whole coat he had on was dripping with blood. His had been dipped in blood. And that vesture, he, was, he had it on. They took it off of him, and they parted it, and they gambled over it. It was full of blood. He was on the cross for six long hours to shed the blood necessary to clean up his wife, his bride, so that they could go to the supper. That blood is what was shed on the cross. And Jesus, after he died, they buried him in a tomb, and he resurrected in Mark 16, 15, and 16, and he gave the command to the preacher like myself and disciples, all of us who were in the church. We are to go into the world and preach this gospel, that good news of the suffering Savior on the cross and the love of the Father and the love of the Son. And when people believe that, they will be pricked in their heart like they were on the day of Pentecost. And they asked Peter, what, many brothers, what shall we do? Peter told them exactly what Jesus said to do. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. So baptism is where you're washed in the blood, Revelation 1 and verse 5. His baptism is where the church is cleaned up to become the wife of Christ. And once we're in, once we're cleansed in baptism, then we're added to the church. Now that same church is purchased by the blood, Acts twenty twenty eight. Take heed, therefore, in yourself, Lord, the flock, flock the Holy Ghost that made you overseer, to feed the church of God. Notice what he said. He's called the church of God. That's true. Which he purchased with his own blood. So wh which God was the God the Father? God the Son or God the Holy Spirit? It was God the Son on the cross. Which one shed the blood? God the Son. That was him. So when he said Church of God, he's talking about Church of Christ. He purchased the Church of Christ with blood. It took blood to clean up his wife. The Church of Christ would be the wife of Christ, and any woman who is married to a man wears that man's name. To be his wife, she wears his name. When my wife was living, my wife wore my name. Her name was Sharon Brooks. How, how do we know her out of all other people in the audience? Because I would say, Sister Brooks, can you stand? She would raise her hand because she never liked to stand. But that's the only woman who raised her hand because she wore my name. So the only woman going to raise her hand on the day of judgment is the Church of Christ. Why? That wife wears the name of her husband, which is Christ. Now, my friend, you, you know I'm telling the truth about this. Every man on this call know that he will, he will defend his wife, and he'll let that man know, that woman wearing my name, my friend. And that's how a man stands up for his wife, because she got his name. Christ don't stand up for his wife, and she gon she got his name. In Romans 16, 16, Paul says, salute one another, holy kid, the churches of Christ salute you. He called his name right there. Same thing Brother Brooks doing. So here's what I want you to do. If you believe today, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The first thing you got to do to make it to this supper is to go home and be with God. You ain't going to the Father's house. When Jesus comes to get his wife, he's going to take her to the Father's house. It's going to be a big celebration. It's going to be a supper there. We're going to get our name. We're going to say a mansion going to be there. We're going to get our crown. That's why I like that song. 
mansion robe and a crown. I'm going to trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. We'll join him in that land where tears nor sorrows can be found. I receive my mansion, my robe, and my crown. All that's going to happen at the supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Will you make it? Not if you have not been baptized. Not if you're not in the church of Christ, you won't make it. You're not going to make it. Or if you left the church crowd, you're not going to the supper. So here's what I'm saying. If you're on the call today, number one, you must hear the word of the gospel and believe. Acts 15 and verse 7. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith is impossible. He pleases him. He that come to God must believe. So number one and two, you must believe. Here, you must believe. You must hear the gospel. You must believe. Number three, you must repent. Luke 13, 3 and 5. You've got to stop making excuses for getting baptized and just go get baptized. Quit, quit making excuses and repent. Say, I didn't believe it, but I do today. Well, then call us. We'll take you up there and baptize you. Or you're just making a lot of, blowing a lot of hot air. Hot air. When you repent, you change. You get out of the burning house. You believe you're in it. You'll get out. You don't have to have to beg you to get out of the burning house. When you feel the heat, you get out. Yeah, that's repentance. Then be willing to stand before me and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said, every knee will bow and every mind will make that confession. On the day he come back, everybody's going to say he was the Son of God. But now everybody's going to the supper. Only those who go to the supper are those who say he, they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God right now while you live, just like the unit did in Acts 8 and verse 37. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So would you have to do that? I would ask you today, if you you on this call, you want to be baptized, you raise your hand on this call, I'll ask you, I would let all of you people hear you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and we will have you to meet at the church building closer to you, and we'll get you baptized. But you've got to make that confession. You're going to do it now. Uh, while you're living, or you're going to do it at the other, you're going to say it. One way or the other, everybody's going to say he's the Son of God one day, one day. Then after that, you've got to be baptized, as I talked about over and over on this call. That's the fifth step. you got to be baptized. Last step, you got to live faithful. So just because you're a member of church Christ, you may know people who are members of church Christ, but they're not faithful. They're not saved. You're not doing something once saved, always saved. You're, yes, the members of the church of Christ are saved, but members must be faithful. So don't get me wrong. And, and believe there's some members of church. Some of y'all might be shacking with them or living with them or, or drinking with them and partying with them. I don't know what that, but I know, I know some of them ain't living right. Some of them that left the church, they ain't been back to the church. They ain't going to go back to the church. They just laying up talking about the one church. They don't talk about the one church. Live it. So I can't uh, get my friend to obey because you ain't living right in front of them. They ain't going to listen to nothing you saying. That's what ever amazes me about members of the church. You can't expect people to listen to you when you're living like the devil. Well, to, to our visitors, you can see, I'm not trying to favor Church of Christ people. I'm telling them they got to do right just like you got to do right, just like I got to do right. Brother Brooks say. I ain't saying I'm a, I'm a holier than thou person. I'm saying I'm, 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 I'm going to beat most people, though. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to repent when I need to. I'm going to make confession when, after I've repented. I'm going to make my confession. I'm going to ask for forgiveness. I'm going to keep going to the church building every time uh, I, I can go. I'm going to keep singing. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday. I've been baptized, and I'm going. this is the way I'm going to die. Just like that. I'm believing that that blood is for the forgiveness of sin. I'm going to drink it every week. You know, I tell some people, when I drink the he said, Jesus, take ye all of it. When I drink the communion, I try to get every drop out of that community because I believe it's for the forgiveness of sins. I know I need it. I know I need it. I am not saying this because I don't need it. I'm greater than you. I'm saying this because all of us need the blood. <laughs> Amen. Ain't nobody perfect, y'all. You got to live it. You got to live it. You got to get it right when you fall. That's what it's all about. So that's what this lesson is. Uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. Will you be one who will go to the marriage supper? At this time, we will ask all those who are on the call who are not members of Church Christ, you want to get baptized, just, just hit five star on your phone. If you want to make a prayer request or if you're a member of the church and you want to come home repenting so you can go to the marriage supper, then you act, make your confession, you repent. If you want to call, you're not a member of Church Christ and you want to get baptized so you can go to the marriage supper, you heard the truth this morning. Will you obey it? It's up to you. Jesus, he that rejected me, received not my word, and one that judged him. The words that I've spoken, the same, were judging the last day. You've already been judged, because I just preached.